So at 419 TOL, what we're doing is creating original news content, original creative content to highlight the unique features, culture, and people of the Toledo region. Hopefully to invite a new generation of Toledoans into a conversation about what made Toledo the place that it is today and how we usher it into the future in the best possible way. So 419 TOL content is absolutely free for you to enjoy, but we're gonna be looking for community partners, companies, organizations who believe in the work that we're doing to help us produce more of this unique original content about our community. You too, even as an individual, can support the work that we're doing here. You got $20 or whatever amount you wanna do, as small as a dollar, you can support this work via the Cash App. This content is free and it will be free for you to enjoy for as long as you want and as much as you wanna enjoy. For as little or as much as you wanna support the work that we're doing, it's completely up to you. But you can watch as much of it and enjoy as much of it as often as you like. With that, welcome to this show and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for joining me today to cook and to talk. Great. It's good to be here. Good to see you after a little hiatus, right? It has been. You and I worked together for a long time, but since I've retired, you have gained a new title, the beer professor. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not my official title at UT, <laughs> so uh, it's not something that was uh, you know, given to me by anyone. But uh, Absolutely. How does the professor part fit in? Professor part is because I've uh, been doing research. Uh, academic research on beer for about the same period, four, four and a half years. And uh, kind of, I'm, I'm a geographer by, by training, so I've been kind of interested in, uh, you know, this growth of the, the kind of craft beer movement and where it's growing and why it's growing and also how it can impact local economies. So I sense a lot of overlap here with the work we did together when I worked at the Urban Affairs Center with food. Right, right. And interest in local food and how that was expanding. What, how are they the same? How are they different? Well, you know, I, I, I think that's where my interests and your interests do kind of coincide and come together because I think this whole craft beer movement is about local beer, right? Mm -hmm. Being produced by people that live in the community that grew up in the community, that have connections to the community, and have decided to basically take their hobby, which is home brewing, and commercialize that hobby. And I think what we're also seeing is, we're also seeing craft brewers starting to use local ingredients in, in brewing. So hops, for example, are a key ingredient in beer. We get most of our hops from the Pacific Northwest, but in the last 10 years, we now see hops being grown in states like Ohio and Michigan and farmers diversifying into hops. And basically this because, it's because craft brewers are coming to them and say, hey, we would like to use some local hops in, in our beer. So we, know, we don't just see the localization of production of the final product, but also increasingly we see the, the supply chain getting shorter and this opportunity to use some local ingredients in, in the actual product. So I think that's exciting. Now, you and I had the opportunity to, tr to be in Belgium when we were working right, at greenhouses. Yeah, yeah. And I was astounded at how important beer was yeah. and how seriously it was taken, the beer itself, and the rituals around drinking beer. Can you right. talk about that a little and whether Belgium is unique in that way? Well, you know, in, in, in the beer world, you know, if you had to rank all the countries in terms of their beer culture, there's absolutely no doubt if you ask anyone, Belgium is number one. Uh, and they've just had this long, long tradition of appreciating beer, understanding beer. What did that have to do with in terms of its geography? Using local ingredients, right? And at that time it wasn't necessarily hops being used as an ingredient in beer, but they would use other other local local ingredients and again if you go back far enough because of the restrictions in transportation kind of technology using local ingredients was a necessity today it's a choice right because we can choose to right. 
use local or we can source those ingredients from you know halfway across the world but you know the Belgians have had this beer culture going back literally centuries and certainly they have mass producers in Belgium but I think what the Belgians have never lost sight of is the importance of the smaller scale breweries and I think they've just always valued the, the idea of kind of quality in terms of the product and uh, Belgian beers are continually ranked as being just among the best in the world with in fact the the Trappist beers, the beers still brewed in monasteries today, uh, being among the best of the best. Thanks for helping me learn more about yeah, beer. And right. Are you ready to cook? That should be fun. All right, here we go. We'll wash our hands and we'll get ready to Put together a carbonade. A little bit. All right, would you like to wear an apron now? So this is kind of a long recipe and I got started, did a little preparation so that we can make real progress in the time we have together. Okay. So I've chopped a few onions and browned a little bit of the beef, but uh, Pretty much every step of this, there's some of it for us to do. Okay. And what we're making is a Belgian beef and beer stew. Okay. So thank you for picking up the Belgian beer that is right. a key part of this. Uh, other key parts are browned beef, caramelized onions, and unlike um, French beef stews, instead of wine, we're going to braise that in beer. Okay. Uh, and we're going to add some vinegar, a little bit of vinegar, a little bit of brown sugar. So it'll have that sweetness and that tartness. And those are um, characteristic of this stew. It's called a carbonade. And I am appalled to say that in Belgium, it's frequently served over French fries. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna serve it with noodles probably. Okay. okay. But uh, first thing we're gonna do is finish browning this beef okay. and then add it to the part that was done ahead. So. So this is a pretty brown. We'll put it in the, in the uh, bowl. It's getting a little dry, so. How much beef do you have there, Paul? About four pounds. Four pounds? Yeah. Yeah. I like to have leftovers. Stews, of course, you can make a hat and they get a little bit even better as they right. sit. Right, oh, yeah. I lost one. Drop in that bacon. Bacon, okay. Yep. We'll let it render. And as soon as that renders, we're gonna take the bacon out, put it with the beef, and then we're gonna cook some onion. With so you use the term render, what, what does that mean? It means all of the fat will come out of these pieces. Okay. And what's remaining, we'll put back in with the beef, but okay. we'll use that bacon fat to flavor the onions that we're going to cook. So if I were making a bit of onion, just uh, same style as this, right? I think when we were in Belgium, Neil, we had some kind of a beef stew dish. Do you remember that? Yeah, I think I think we did. Uh, Probably I, pretty I close to this. We put a bit of some good meals and obviously some good beer as well, right? Absolutely, and every different kind of beer had its own glass. Yep, that's very uh, a piece of the Belgian tradition. Uh huh. Uh, and again, I think it, it would be something nice to see here. Uh, and, you know, people that have a real uh, sophisticated or refined palate for beer will tell you that the glass does matter. So, uh, have you involved Libby Glass in this discussion? No, I haven't. I haven't. Uh, but that would be... That would be an interesting discussion to have. Uh, or even on a smaller scale, the artisans at the Etzlid Museum of Art. Right, that would, uh, that would also be a nice discussion to have. Uh, 
I suspect most of the craft breweries are buying their glassware from some mass producer somewhere. Right. That, uh, and mo most craft breweries will have maybe uh, you know three different styles of glass. You know, and, and they'll depending on what right. beer you order, right. then you will get a particular particular glass. Mm -hmm. And then if you order a you know, kind of high octane beer that's uh, maybe 10% alcohol by volume. Uh -huh. It'll give you a, a smaller amount of that. Uh, quite simply because it's uh, a much stronger beer. Uh -huh. Then the glass again might be uh, would be appropriate to the style and the, the amount of beer you're getting. You know, I went to an event at the art museum where cocktails were served in glasses they had made. Okay. Um, so maybe maybe we could interest somebody. You know, I, I think a there's. Part of that. You know, it, it's interesting because you know what you're talking about here, Paul, is kind of the supply chain, right? That right. Goes into the industry. And, well, the uh, supply chain, but the horizontal. Right. Uh, you know what we right. serve it in and what yep. we serve it with. Right. And uh, you know, there's this focus on the craft breweries being local and supporting the local economy mm -hmm. uh, and I think that would be another way in which in which that could be done. You know it's always a question of fit isn't it? Right. So I mean the Museum of Art is so important here and glass is so important here Right. that it, it seems to me an opportunity to hook that into this whole discussion of how uh, craft beer could help revitalize the economy. So why is it served warm, and what kind of beer is served warm? Well, uh, you know, typical, your, there's basically two styles of beer, uh, what are called ales and what are called lagers. And, you know, you associate lagers with the lighter colored beers, ales with the darker colored beers, although those, that's not always the case. Yeah, because there's pale ale. Right, and uh, it's really to do with the type of yeast which is used to, to ferment the beer, to brew the beer. But uh, ales tend to be served at a warmer temperature than, than lagers. And it's to do with kind of bringing out that flavor. And like because when, when, when you chill a beer, right, you, you kind of you kill some of the, the flavor. And that's why something like Budweiser is, <laughs> is chilled, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the truth. And, uh, you know, if you have a Budweiser and you, you sit there and you nurse it for an hour, uh, you know, after about 20 minutes, half an hour, it really doesn't taste all that good. It doesn't, it doesn't improve with, uh, oh, with, that's with, fascinating. With, uh, with warming, as it were. Uh -huh. But uh, if you get an, uh, an IPA or a brown ale or something, uh -huh. it'll actually taste better, uh, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes later oh, wow. uh, than it does when it first comes out, you know, comes out the tap. And how does that then relate to the fact that we serve white wines chilled and red wines not? Yeah, now I know very little about wines, but yeah, you're right. That's a, that's a standard practice, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder why mm -hmm. that is. It has to, it must do with the, the, the flavor profile, right? The, I, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So we're going to take a look at this recipe I wrote down, and I wonder okay. if you could help me. The things that are going to go in next can go right in that glass bowl. Okay. And so we're going to need two and a half tablespoons of this brown sugar. And here are my measuring. Two and a half? Two and a half. This is not precision. So the beer that you brought. Yeah. Tell me about that beer that's going to go with these browned beef and onions. So what I, what I brought, brought was a, what's called a Belgian Trappist beer. Mm -hmm. It's uh, brewed in a monastery in Belgium. It's, uh, it's called Chimé. So it's going to be a pretty typical uh, kind of Trappist ale. It's going to be kind of nice and, nice and heavy, I guess. You know, it's going to have a nice body to it. Well, it makes sense. Uh, heavy, heavy yeah, yeah. flavor with, with 
meat and mustard and vinegar. Yeah, so uh, it should, should pair well with the you know, pair well with the stew. I think what is nice about that is we're we're uh, using a beer which uh, has a long tradition uh, associated with it. All right, I'm going to put the meat back in with the onions. Good, it fit. When you get that pretty fine, you can throw that in. Okay, I'll just uh, yeah, I, uh, whip it on the, on the knife here, Paula. I... Yeah, I had a tool out. Tell me what you want to do. This is what I use. It's easier to do. We're going to sweep it onto here? Yep. In here? That's right. Okay. And everything in that glass bowl is going in here. Everything can go right in. And there's a couple of bay leaves there you can put in. Just as is? Just as is. Okay. Yeah. Those are bay leaves from my plant on the window. It's about as local as I can get. I think this is perfect. We have enough room for a beer. About 12 ounces of beer, don't we? Excellent. Now, mm -hmm. you know this is 9% by volume, so you uh, may have to sit down after. You know, <laughs> stew, so. Yeah, but after we cook it, won't <laughs> the alcohol be gone? Yeah, it will. Yeah. All right. Now, I'm not sure how this affects the taste of what we're making, Neil, but it makes it more fun for me. This is a spoon that go into a low oven for three hours. You'll have to come back. Okay. Now, the only problem is we should have invited some investors, and some uh, public officials, so that they understand not just how much it could help the economy, but how delicious this is going to be. And it will be ready about 4.30. Of course, it would be able to sit and probably get better for a day or two. Yeah. Most All right, so let right. me get a couple of okay. glasses. You know, I'm passionate about the connections that can be made through food and in the kitchen. And a lot of connections were made for me today. Obviously, Neil is passionate about beer and, and about craft beer and about the opportunities for a real industry here that would help the local economy, but there are so many things that could be brought into that. We talked about artists, artisans. Could we make beer glasses that were appropriate to the beers we were serving? We're growing some of the ingredients for the beer, the hops, and then, of course, there are so many local chefs who could accommodate and integrate beer into their recipes or as pairings. So this could just be huge. And I, I hope that we can continue to talk about how we bring some of those people together and help it grow. We started planning a headquarters several years ago. It really made sense to consolidate our operations into one location so that we could work uh, more collaboratively together and work more efficiently. Let's go take a walk around. <laughs>